Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from today. My name is Beth Mandel, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm a partner here in the um, employee benefits practice of Thompson Hines Cincinnati office, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Kim Wilcoxon, who's also a partner in the employee benefits practice and also in the Cincinnati office. Today's webinar will examine the new guidance and actions and the actions group health plan sponsors and fiduciaries should take to ensure they are prepared to respond to requests from the DOL and or plan participants in response to mental health parity and addiction equity act guidance. Um, we will be looking at, let's see. We will be looking at um, a number of issues, including how did we get here? What guidance was issued? How does that guidance impact plans now? Because um, a, a, much of this guidance gives us good insight into how we should be interpreting the current tools that we have. And then additionally, we'll look at how the proposed regulations will impact plans if finalized in their proposed form. So we're gonna start with how did we get here? The background of the mental health parity rules. So to begin with, way back in 1996, we had the Mental Health Parity Act, which impacted really only annual and lifetime dollar limits on mental health benefits. Several years later, in 2008, we got MAPIA. Um, and I had somebody asked the other day, how do you pronounce that? We, we pronounce it MAPIA, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008, which extended the Mental Health Parity Act provisions to substance use disorder benefits. And then it added rules for financial restrictions and treatment limitations. It added some rules for disclosures, and it required biannual reporting to Congress. Now, the guiding principle behind MAPIA, according to the proposed regulations that we just received, is that MAPIA was enacted with the concept of protecting people who needed to access mental health care. So the idea is just because you need care for a mental health condition, you shouldn't have a harder time getting that care than if you needed that care for a medical condition. That is the fundamental guiding principle behind everything we're talking about today, removing barriers from people who need mental health care. Now we're gonna use a couple of terms in the slides. We may not use these uh, as we speak, but as you see these terms in the slides, know that MHSUD refers to mental health and or substance use disorder. MS refers to medical and or surgical. QTL refers to quantitative treatment limitations and sometimes also financial um, requirements. And then NQTLs refer to non-quantitative treatment limitations. QTLs and NQTLs and basically NQTLs will be the focus of today's presentation. And why is that? Well, it's because in the final regulations that we got under MAPIA back in 2013, we saw a distinction between the types of treatment limitations and how to confirm that they are compliant with the mental health parity rules. So for quantitative treatment limitations or financial restrictions, which basically are limitations on mental health benefits that involve numbers, right? 20% coinsurance, five visit limit, anything that has numbers, we can run a numerical analysis. And we have to make sure that any financial requirement or treatment limitation applied to mental health or substance use disorder benefits are not more restrictive than the predominant financial restrict, financial requirement or treatment limitation applied to substantially all medical surgical benefits. We're not gonna focus a lot on that in today's presentation, but those concepts will come up a little later. So I wanted to be sure that was fresh in your mind. On the NQTL side, a non-quantitative treatment limitation is something that's not associated with a number so we can't run a numerical test to confirm that it's compliant. Instead, we have more of a social sciences approach where we have to look at the processes, strategies, evidentiary standards, and other factors used in applying the non-quantitative treatment limitation to mental health or substance use disorder benefits. And we have to make sure that they are comparable to and applied no more stringently than the processes, strategies, evidentiary standards, or other factors used in applying the limitation with respect to medical surgical benefits. Now, following the final regulations, we then got legislation in the form of the 21st Century Cures Act, 
which required the Department of Labor to create additional guidance, including this compliance program document that we all know as the self-compliance tool. Then we had the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which for the first time required us to put down in writing how our NQTLs are compliant with the mental health parity rules. It also requires annual reporting to Congress. So we know that those non-quantitative treatment limitations, we have to look at the processes, the strategies, the factors, et cetera. We know now that we have to put that analysis in writing, but how, how do we do that, right? The regulations don't provide content requirements for NQTL analyses. What we had prior to the guidance that was just released was a self-compliance tool, which encouraged us to identify each NQTL and all the services to which the NQTL applied. We had to identify the factors considered in the design of the NQTL. Not surprisingly, we had to identify the sources, processes, strategies, evidentiary standards used for those factors. And then we had to ask ourselves, are those processes, strategies, yada, yada, comparable to and applied no more stringently than the yada, yada on the medical side? With the Consolidated Appropriations Act, we got the requirement to include this content in writing, the written analysis. We have to provide that to the DOL now upon request. We have to identify the specific plan or coverage terms regarding the NQTLs. We have to identify the factors, the evidentiary standards, the specific findings. And then according to the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the process for providing these to the DOL goes like this. First, the DOL requests information. Then the plan turns over their NQTL analyses. Then if the Department of Labor determines that that NQTL analysis is non-compliant, the DOL goes back to the plan and then the plan has to submit updated analyses within 45 days. Based on that, if the DOL makes a determination, a final determination of non-compliance, then the plan must notify covered individuals within seven days. Now, under the Consolidated Appropriations Act, there was no deadline for that second point there, for the plan to respond back to the DOL. In reality, what we saw was the DOL asking for very short turnaround times. And their analysis, their, their reasoning behind that was, well, since 2008, your plan had to have been in compliance with the mental health parity rules. You had to have known how your plan was in compliance. You know, since 2013, you should have understood that you needed to identify the processes, the strategies, the factors. Since February of 2021, you should have had all of this stuff in writing. So it shouldn't take you very long to just pull that off your computer and send it on over to us. Whether that's reasonable or unreasonable, that's sort of their thinking behind the short deadlines. Um, in what we've seen since this began, though, is that the Department of Labor has not been super strict in the response. Um, they have been working with plans. So this is not, even though they're expecting you to respond right away, if you don't, if, if it's insufficient, they have not gone straight to bullet three. They are working with plans asking for more information, which is a good thing. Yeah, and we'll see, you know, if that continues or if, you know, as there's increased um, uh, focus put on enforcement, whether they start to take a more hard line approach um, and, and some changes in the regs might be signaling that. So what guidance was issued recently? So last month, um, we, we got basically a big guidance dump. Um, we got the 2022 enforcement fact sheet, the um, annual report to Congress, we, we got um, a technical release that I'll talk about a little bit later and a guidance compendium. Now the guidance compendium um, is basically just collecting much of the guidance that had already been previously collected um, that can be found on the DOL's uh, mental health parity website. Um, and then finally, the last piece of guidance that we got were the proposed regulations. Um, so I will be talking more about the proposed regulations later in this presentation. Kim's going to talk to you about some important information that we can glean from um, the, in some cases from the proposed regulations, but more so from the 2023 report to Congress um, and what that might tell us about how we should be looking at these reports currently. 
So how does this guidance impact plans now? As Beth mentioned, you know, we have two pieces of guidance that reflect what the Department of Labor is currently doing. So the first is the report to Congress. This is the report that the Consolidated Appropriations Act required be provided every year. Uh, it, the one that we just received covers NQTL analysis requests during the period November 1, 2021 through July 31, 2022. And this is our second report to Congress since the CAA was enacted. So because there have been some shorter reporting periods, this report also provides combined statistics from February 10th of 2021 through July 31 of 2022. And I say February 10th because that was the first date that the Department of Labor was allowed to request analyses, although the first analysis they actually requested was April 10th, 2021. So if you're reading the report, that may be a difference in the dates there. We also have an enforcement fact sheet which covers investigations that were actually closed in 2022. So together, these documents explain the Department of Labor's experience in enforcing the mental health parity rules. And basically what they show us is what everyone is doing wrong. So it's important to understand what compliance issues have been experienced by other plans and making sure your plan is not designed or operated in the same manner. In the report to Congress, the Department of Labor identified a number of priority areas where they focus their enforcement efforts. I think it's important to note that we have two new ones. So in last year's report, those top four were included. This year, we have two new ones, one being impermissible exclusions of key treatments for mental health and substance use disorder conditions and adequacy standards for mental health and substance use disorder provider networks. Um, both of those are in, addressed in the proposed regulations that Beth's going to touch on a little later. It's important to pay attention to compliance in these areas because we know they are an area of focus for the Department of Labor. Now, it's interesting in the report to Congress, the Department of Labor sort of explained their enforcement approach. And it's important here, they are trying to use their limited resources in the way that gets them the most bang for the buck. According to the report to Congress, they have one investigator for every 7,700 health plans. And then if you add in other benefit plans, other welfare plans, retirement plans, it's one investigator for every 12,200 plans. So it's not like they can go and ask, you know, for NQTL analyses from every single plan that's out there. They just don't have the resources at the time. So what they're doing is they're focusing their efforts on specific leads. So if they have a, an open investigation, they may be requesting an NQTL analysis. If they get a heads up from a state or federal regulatory partner, or if they see something in the media, they get a participant complaint. This is the way the Department of Labor gets to your door. Um, they are not going out and doing random audits at this time. Now, they're also prioritizing potential violations that stem from actions of service providers, which is really important because we all know that 99% of mental health parity compliance falls at the feet of the service providers. They are the ones who develop and administer most of the NQTLs. Employers most often don't have the knowledge or the expertise to be able to determine that the plan is in compliance with mental health parity. So wouldn't it be nice that the Department of Labor just went to the TPAs and said, you know, let's work together and, and fix this. And that's what they're trying to do. And I say trying to do because the DOL doesn't have enforcement authority over the TPAs. They do over the insurance companies. But a TPA for a self-funded plan, the Department of Labor doesn't have enforcement authority. They do have investigative authority. So they can ask a TPA about a plan's compliance, and we've seen that happen. According to the report to Congress, the Department of Labor is, is, has, did have a particular effort in going out to service providers and asking specifically about impermissible, potentially impermissible exclusions. So they're going out and working with the service providers ahead of time before or even without ever asking the plan for their analysis. And so what we've seen is service providers sometimes changing the standard terms of their plans based on what they've done with the Department of Labor. And I've noted here on this slide some of the examples of impermissible potential, potential impermissible exclusions that the Department of Labor had focused on. So if your plan excludes coverage for any of these treatments as described here, that's a big red flag. You should be looking at changing that soon. 
And Kim, I would think that, you know, anytime a plan sponsor is getting an email from their TPA or other service provider signaling, hey, we're going to be changing this standard going mm -hmm. forward, and it relates to mental health. You might want to ask at that point, you know, what what's causing you to change the standard? It's very likely, or if not very likely, at least possible, that the DOL has initiated some sort of action with that service provider. Now, uh, according to the enforcement fact sheet, and the Department of Labor does issue these every year, so you can go back several years and sort of look at the statistics and how things have changed. I just went back three years here, so you can see, and this is based on closed investigations. Um, you can see how over time things have changed a little bit and specifically down at the bottom with the NQTLs in 2022, we've had significantly more violations involving NQTLs and that may be because this was the first time that the Department of Labor had actually gotten through some enforcement efforts on NQTL analysis. So uh, examples of enforcement actions, as I said, the, the enforcement fact sheet and the report to Congress explain what the Department of Labor has been doing with specific plans, you know, and how those plans have corrected it. I think it's important to spend some time on the enforcement actions, if not during this presentation, then afterwards, to understand what did other people do wrong and are we doing the same thing. First bullet point is huge, excluding coverage of ABA therapy when you're covering other treatments for autism. I feel like the Department of Labor has been hammering this home for years. If your plan still excludes coverage or puts a limit on ABA therapy, uh, that's something you really should be paying attention to. Similarly, coverage of methadone to treat opioid use disorder. If you're not covering that, but you are covering it to treat medical surgical conditions, that's a problem. Generally, anytime you're excluding something for a mental health purpose, but you're also covering it for a medical purpose, that's a big red flag. We're also seeing a big focus on nutritional counseling. So if you have limits or exclusions for nutritional counseling, that's something to pay attention to. Prior authorization is a big focus for the Department of Labor. If your plan requires prior authorization for all mental health and substance use disorder benefits, which I will say was very, very common years ago, um, if your plan still has that, that's a problem. Now, you can certainly require prior authorization for some benefits on the mental health side and some on the medical surgical side, but your NQTL analysis has to defend that. Um, in one case, uh, the NQTL analysis did not defend, did not show how the services chosen for prior authorization were compliant. And in fact, the Department of Labor discovered that the TPA had an NQTL analysis, but wasn't following it. And that's gonna be a problem as well. Case management, medical management, there's some examples here, and then also financial requirements and gatekeeping. Uh, again, I encourage you to take a look at these examples and just make sure that it, it, your plan doesn't have any of the similar red flags. Moving then to NQTL analyses, um, based on the report to Congress in the most recent reporting period, these are the areas for which the Department of Labor is requesting analyses. Now, I will say that under the CAA, the requirement is to have an NQTL analysis for each NQTL under the plan. And you have to be ready to turn those over to the Department of Labor upon request. But at this point, the Department of Labor is not requesting the full set of NQTL analyses. They are requesting anywhere from between one to five from a plan. Um, at targeting specific things. And you can see here the, the, the most common NQTL analysis they're requesting is with respect to prior authorization, prior certification, prior notification. Um, additionally, they're looking at exclusion of ABA, intensive behavioral, rehabilitative, habilitative, cognitive therapy. Uh, again, a big focus on treatment for autism. And then next, that new focus priority, network adequacy. Network adequacy is gonna be a, a big area of focus for the Department of Labor. The next slide talks about the, um, the statistics on the Department of Labor's requests for NQTL analyses since the Consolidated Appropriations Act requirement began. Now for you eagle-eyed people in the audience, I fully admit that my math on this slide is incorrect. 
I'll even say it is not my math. I pulled these numbers directly from the report and they do not add up correctly. So do not fault me for this. This is, this is you know, what I got. But what you can see in 2022 in the first reporting period is that the Department of Labor, and, and again, the, the, the report actually does look both at statistics of EBSA, the Department of Labor, and CMS because HHS also has enforcement authority, but it's generally over you know, fully insured plans and other things. So our focus on today's presentation is gonna be on Department of Labor enforcement. So these numbers are Department of Labor. The first time around, the DOL requested 156 letters, which involved 217 unique NQTLs. And so if they asked for the prior authorization NQTL, the plan would have to turn over the prior authorization NQTL for inpatient in network, inpatient out of network, right? Outpatient in network, all six different classifications. They're only counting that as one, so that unique NQTL. Uh, none of them were initially sufficient, as we learned last year. Uh, the initial determination letters, that, that next like third bullet on that slide, they sent out 30 letters for 48 NQTLs, and in the first reporting period did not find that anybody was out of compliance. That's not because everybody was in compliance. That's because they didn't get all the way through any of their investigations. So come 2023, we now hear in the second reporting period, there were 25 more letters. This is not an indication of a reduction in effort by the Department of Labor. This is a reflection of the fact that those 156 were still in process. And they were targeting their efforts on service providers where, again, they could impact the most amount of plans. So don't look at that reduction in number as you know, something to be other than what it is. Uh, all, of, all told, we're still looking at 182, again, not my math, letters. <laughs> um, but still, nothing that came in was sufficient. Not a thing was sufficient the first time around. And we did see three opportunities or, or situations where plans were had a final determination of non-compliance. And under the CAA, if you have a, non, a final determination of non-compliance, your name gets put in this report. I am not gonna further name and shame those uh, plans, but we will go through what they did wrong. According to the report to Congress, there are common deficiencies. Why is it that nothing they got back was correct? Um, this is why. They failed to document the comparative analysis. And I will say this was very common with the first sort of set of standard NQTL analyses that we saw. We would get a chart. On the left side was what they did for medical. On the right side is what they did for mental health. And that was it. They just showed what the factors and the strategies and the processes were. But there was no third column that said, here's why these are comparable. And the Department of Labor told us last year, that's not good enough. We need to know why these are comparable. And I will say, since that report came out last year, we have seen TPAs improve their NQTL analyses to include a, 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 you know, a third column of why these are comparable. Now, is the content of that column sufficient? That's a different question, but at least it's there. You can see here on the slide other deficiencies. These are things we want to avoid when we're creating or reviewing NQTL analyses. And I say that, I say we, right? We are not doing this again. It is the vendor, the service provider, typically that creates the NQTL analysis. If your service provider is not doing it well, what do we do about that? We're gonna revisit that in just a little bit. So let's take a look and see what was it that people did so poorly that the Department of Labor came back and said, no, you are absolutely out of compliance. First one, in this case, the plan required pre-certification for all outpatient mental health benefits, but only some outpatient mental health med medical surgical benefits. So we talked about a few slides ago, big, big, big red flag. So the plan failed to provide an NQTL analysis upon DOL request. That's not surprising because probably when this was requested, everybody was still scrambling because we didn't realize we had to put these things in writing. The plan submitted an action plan to change the scope of pre-certification. Okay, okay, we're gonna back off. We're not gonna require pre-certification for everything just for these mental health services. But the analysis that they provided with that, which was late, was insufficient. It failed to identify and define all the factors used to apply the pre-certification requirement. 
It failed to demonstrate comparable application in operation of the NQTL and of the factors. Negative number two, the plan applied prior authorization requirements on certain outpatient benefits. So we're not in the first situation, right? We've, we've got some, and that, that's not the big red flag. But again, the plan failed to provide an NQTL analysis upon request. The analysis they subsequently provided failed to identify all the benefits that were subject to prior authorization, failed to identify the factors, failed to identify the sources. It just didn't do what it was supposed to do. And so the Department of Labor determined that it was finally non-compliant. And third, in this case, the plan applied a more stringent penalty for failure to obtain prior authorization for mental health benefits than it did for medical surgical benefits. And this is, I think, a very illustrative example because this plan had a carve-out behavioral health vendor, right? They had separate vendors to administer the medical surgical claims and the mental health claims. And the service providers each had their own NQTL analyses, but they were different. So the, the factors that were used to apply the, the prior authorization on the medical side were different than the factors used. On, and there was no sort of comparability analysis. The plan's corrective action indicated that it would amend the prior authorization penalty, but didn't actually say when they were going to do that. And that must have been what threw the Department of Labor's hands up and said, <laughs> you know, like, you, know, you got to get this done. So what we've seen in the final, final, you are out of compliance, generally all relates to the failure to do a correct, full, sufficient NQTL analysis. So what do we do about that? Well. The proposed regulations have a new section. And again, proposed regulations aren't effective until they're finalized. But here, what we have is this proposed set of content requirements for the NQTL analysis. And if you look at that set of content requirements and you look back at the slide for common deficiencies, and we see everything the Department of Labor said people aren't doing, basically the proposed regulations are telling us to do what the Department of Labor is saying people aren't doing. So I think that shows us a good sort of roadmap toward what we can do to beef up these analyses and make sure that they are sufficient. In addition, the proposed definitions of the proposed regulations help a little bit more sort of explain what, it, what does the Department of Labor mean by factor and strategy and process and evidentiary standards. These I think should be helpful and illustrative for the, um, for the TPAs to help them improve their um, analyses. So ultimately, why is this important? It's not just a homework exercise. It's not busy work to put this stuff in writing. The Department of Labor feels like comparative analyses are an opportunity for plans and issuers to think carefully and deeply about how they apply NQTLs to mental health and substance use disorder benefits as compared to medical surgical benefits. Either through a long-standing practice or a new limitation. This comes directly from the report to Congress. Ultimately, the Department of Labor wants plans to think through and make sure that their plan design is intentionally sufficient to remove barriers from people who are using mental health services. Now, the problem with this, again, is that even if the plan tried to think through this, you can't do it without the knowledge and the expertise of the TPA. So there's got to be a partnership between the TPA and the plan in order to really get this done. We're going to revisit some, you know, what do we do about that at the end of the presentation. But for now, I want to turn it over to Beth and let her talk a little bit about the proposed regulations. Yep. And I, before I get started talking about the proposed regulations, I just want to um, address a couple of questions that have come in since we got started. Um, a couple of people have asked about the slide deck. We will be sending out both the slide deck and a recording of the presentation um, after completion of the presentation. Usually it takes about one or two days. Um, and then we, we got some substantive questions that we will address um, you know, closer to the end of the presentation, including, which is the, you know, the big issue on everybody's mind, what do you do if a TPA refuses to do your analyses for you? So um, we will address that as we move into our takeaways for today. And um, I'm going to get started talking about the proposed regulations. So 
the proposed regulations beef up the analyses that plans are going to have to do with respect to their non-quantitative treatment limitations if, if these regulations are finalized. Um, I actually think that the framework that was um, proposed by the DOL makes a lot of sense. As Kim noted, um, the, the um, enhanced guidance that the regulations include related to the written analyses sort of track the guidance that we've received thus far, um, including the reports regarding non-compliance and what plans are supposed to be doing to improve their non-quantitative treatment limitation analyses. But under these proposed regs, um, if they become finalized, plans will have to basically do three different types of analyses that are somewhat all related um, when looking at their NQTLs. First, there's a new test or a new analysis that the DOL has proposed. Um, the, it, it centers around making sure that the um, NQTLs that are applied to mental health and substance use disorder benefits are no more restrictive than the NQTLs applied to the medical and surgical benefits. And it's a test that is somewhat similar to the test that you're probably more familiar with on the um, quantitative treatment limitation side. So it's requiring you to basically take a look within each classification. And, and again, the classifications are inpatient in-network benefits, inpatient out-of-network benefits, outpatient in-network benefits, outpatient out-of-network benefits, emergency care, and prescription drugs. And within each of those frameworks, you have to do um, somewhat of a quantitative analysis to determine the impact that the, um, that the uh, or not the impact, but how frequently the non-quantitative treatment limitation is being applied on the medical surgical side versus the non-quantitative treatment limitation side. We'll look at that in more depth in a moment. Then there's the comparability in design and application of the NQTL component. And that is sort of um, similar to what we currently have now with respect to the analysis that's required for that written comparative analyses. Again, beefed up a little bit um, to address some of the failures that we've seen in the analyses so far. And then what they did is they broke out the sort of as applied analysis um, that is supposed to be done under the current written analysis framework, and they've made that its own component. So um, plans will, will be expected to do more of a deep dive evaluation of relevant data related to the actual outcomes that are occurring when these NQTLs are applied on a claim by claim basis. Um, and if that data analysis reveals that there are you know, significant differences in outcomes, then you're gonna have to explain that. So even if something looks great you know, on paper, if it's resulting in a significant disparate impact with respect to mental health substance use disorder benefits, that's going to have to be justified. Um, and if you can't justify it, then we're looking at a violation. There are two exceptions that I think are, are going to become very important as we move forward. So when, when somebody is looking at these three components, if you fail one or more of these components, it's possible that you may still be able to rely on one of these exceptions um, in order to justify the NQTL that has been applied to mental health substance use disorder benefits. Those exceptions are preventing fraud, waste, and abuse, and then um, situations where you have designed an NQTL and are applying an NQTL based on impartial professional um, medical and clinical standards. Again, we'll look at those in more detail in a moment. So let's look at this proposed um, no more restrictive component in greater detail. So what this is requiring is that plans may not apply any non-quantitative treatment limitation to mental health substance use disorder benefits in any classification. So again, this is a classification by classification test that's more restrictive as written or in operation than the predominant non-quantitative treatment limitation that applies to substantially all medical surgical benefits in the same classification. So when we do this test, what we're actually first looking at is, okay, we take the, the non-quantitative treatment limitation. 
And we look at, does it apply to substantially all of the medical surgical benefits in that classification? The DOL has set or proposed a level of two thirds as um, meeting that substantially all threshold. So if, for example, you had a prior authorization requirement and it turns out that that requirement applies to approximately two thirds of the medical surgical benefits, it applies to substantially all. I'll go through in a moment how we sort of do that analysis. But um, if we can get to that, two thirds threshold, then we have to look at what's the most common or frequent variation of the non-quantitative treatment limitation. So if we have, for example, a non-quantitative treatment limitation that, um, that you know, might be interpreted in, in different manner, in, different, in a different manner, we have to look at um, how are the, the different ways that this limitation is being applied? What's the most frequent application of that limitation? And then that is what would be permissible to apply on the mental health substance use disorder side. And I think it's important to note that that two thirds is gonna be calculated based on the expected amount of plan payments. The Department of Labor expects that we are using plan level data to make that calculation, not book of business data. The only way you're allowed to use book of business data is if the plan has an actuary that certifies that the plan level data is not enough to be credible. So when you're, if when you're running these tests, it's important to understand the data that you're getting. You want to be sure it's plan level data to the extent possible. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's look at an example of this because I think that's the best way to kind of understand how we apply this framework. So in this example, the non-quantitative treatment limitation is a medical management requirement. It applies to all inpatient in-network medical surgical benefits and all inpatient in-network mental health substance use disorder benefits. And it requires that um, facilities have a 24-hour on-site nursing service available um, in order for services related to inpatient in-network care to be approved. So the first step, as I mentioned, is we look at the substantially all requirement. We have to determine whether at least two thirds of the medical surgical benefits in the inpatient in-network classification are subject to this NQTL. Um, the way that you do this math is you look at the expected dollar amount of plan payments for medical surgical benefits subject to the NQTL and then you look at the expected dollar amount of plan payments for all medical surgical benefits. So dollar amount expected to be subject to NQTL divided by dollar amount for all medical surgical benefits. And in this case, we see that this NQTL is expected to apply to all medical surgical benefits within the inpatient in-network category or classification. And so basically we have a one-to-one -one ratio here we're meeting that two thirds threshold. Um, so, you know, not that hard with an example like this. I think there are going to be scenarios where it is a little bit more unclear how we perhaps apply this test. For example, when looking at um, NQTLs that involve, you know, narrower exclusions. And the DOL has requested commentary on, you know, how this test might be applied in other contexts. Um, and I think they're recognizing that there may be certain NQTLs where it's going to be difficult or, or at least you know, not entirely clear how this math should be applied. Um, but moving on, looking at this same example. So we've determined that this NQTL applies to substantially all of the medical surgical benefits. Then we have to look at the predominant requirement. In this example, the NQTL has only one variation it's the requirement that facil the facility has 24-hour on-site nursing services. Accordingly, since there's only one variation, that's the predominant variation. So we know that this NQTL applies to substantially all medical surgical services within this classification, and it's the predominant NQTL. So it is under this test, it, it, it is fine to apply this NQTL to the um, mental health and substance use disorder benefits. Now, again, this is just one component. So then you still have to go through those other components. One point that the DOL made is that 
under this new guidance, you don't necessarily have to review these different components in order. So if you wanted to, for example, or if you had already conducted um, the, the second component, the design and application component, and you've determined that perhaps um, you know, you, you don't have the strongest foundation to apply this NQTL to meta, or to mental health substance use disorder benefits, and maybe they're, the evidentiary standards that went into designing this NQTL are not great, you might decide that you no longer want to apply that NQTL before you even do this analysis. So the, I think these three different components are designed to basically lift the curtain for plan sponsors so that they can understand what went into designing these limitations, what's the reasoning why we're continuing to apply these limitations, and how can we determine if there's potential risk. So let's look at another um, example where we're going to have a um, NQTL that has several variations. So under this Example, the plan requires prior authorization from the plan's utilization reviewer that a treatment is medically necessary for all inpatient in-network medical surgical benefits and all inpatient in-network mental health substance use disorder benefits. Um, inpatient in-network benefits for medical surgical conditions are typically approved for periods of one, three, or seven days, after which a treatment plan has to be submitted and approved by the plan. Um, approvals for seven days are the most common. So usually, you know, a treat course of treatments being approved for seven days, after which a treatment plan will have to be submitted. In contrast, when we look at mental health and substance use disorder benefits, they're applying the same framework but routine approval is most commonly given for only one day for a course of treatment. And typically the plan is requiring that, a, that the treating um, provider submit a treatment plan after only one day. So we can see already that there's a more onerous requirement being applied with respect to mental health and substance use disorder benefits. So we go through the test, the no more restrictive component test and look at, again, um, you know, is this, does this apply, does this prior authorization re requirement apply to substantially all medical surgical benefits in the inpatient in-network classification? It appears yes, because it, it appears that this prior authorization requirement applies to all benefits in the relevant classification. So we've, you know, we've got prior authorization, but then we know there are these different variations of that prior authorization requirement. And so that's when this predominant question comes in. And we have to look at what is the most predominant or the, or the most common, most frequent variation that's being applied to medical surgical benefits. And we know from the facts discussed that most commonly they're approving a seven day course of treatment. So that's the most common variation for medical surgical. In contrast, for mental health substance use disorder, the most common, common variation is one day treatment course before requiring a treatment plan. More onerous than the seven day treatment course that's being applied for medical surgical. And therefore, um, in this case, the plan is not applying the predominant variation of the NQTL for medical surgical and the plan is applying a more restrictive variation. So this would be a example of an NQTL that does not pass the no more restrictive component. Now again, it's possible that a plan could still justify this NQTL if they can rely on one of the two exceptions, but they would have to be able to provide proof that, that backs up application of those exceptions. Okay, so now let's look at the design and application component. So as I said, this basically expands on the current core and QTL standard. Um, we do have a somewhat increased emphasis, at least as written in the regs, on the actual design of the NQTL. So looking not just at the application of the NQTL, but what factors and evidentiary um, standards went into designing this NQTL. Um, the guidance does clarify that 
plans can't rely on factors or evidentiary standards that themselves are based on discriminatory information. Um, so, you know, it's possible that some of these NQTLs were developed years, maybe decades ago, um, and the science is always evolving, right? And so if you were relying on um, evidentiary standards, research, published opinions, et cetera, from two decades ago, it's possible that that information is now stale and is not, you know, the current standard. And so that's why it's important to really do a deep dive review of what went into designing these NQTLs. Um, permissible factors and evidentiary standards that plans can rely on include impartially applied, generally recognized independent professional medical or clinical standards, and um, standards reasonably designed to detect or prevent and prove fraud, waste, and abuse. So again, we see that tracking with the exceptions that are recognized um, in the event that one of these components um, results in uh, the, the reveal of a possible violation. Um, and then this is where we again see an increased focus on standards related to network composition that are um, non-quantitative treatment limitations. The DOL is extremely concerned about network composition issues What's meant by network composition, basically standards for provider and facility admission to participate in networks, um, standards for continued network participation, methods for determining reimbursement rates, credentialing standards for network providers, um, and then the procedures that the plan is applying for ensuring there are an adequate number of each category of providers and facilities to actually provide services under the plan. What the DOL is consistently recognizing and hearing from plan participants is that there are issues with respect to mental health and substance use disorder provider networks. It's, it's more difficult to find a provider in some cases, um, and the, there are questions as to you know, what's contributing to that. So is it because reimbursement rates are not high enough for mental health substance use disorder providers? Are there more um, onerous standards being placed on those providers in order for them to become network providers and therefore we don't have enough network providers? So this is definitely a focus of the DOL and it will continue to be um, a focus regardless of what ends up happening, I think, with these uh, final regulations. Um, okay, proposed NQTL framework, data evaluation component. So as I indicated, basically the, the DOL is just placing much greater emphasis on showing your work and um, making sure that you're actually analyzing data to see what impact these limitations are having on um, mental health and substance use disorder benefits when participants are actually filing claims and seeking benefits. So everything on paper might look great, but if you have some um, significant disparity in the way that the NQTL is being applied, that signals that you potentially have a mental health parity violation. And I'll say even before this proposed regulation becomes effective, what we're seeing with the NQTL analysis is uh, you know, a TPA might say, we've done a random sampling and have not found any statistically significant differences in mental health versus medical surgical. If that's what it says in the NQTL analysis, that, that concept is great, but the Department of Labor is not going to accept that as sufficient because they actually want to see the data. Yeah. They want to see those calculations. So that's a, a common deficiency in what we've seen in the report to Congress. All right, and then um, the exceptions that I've mentioned a couple of times. So if you go through those components, you're seeing a potential violation, but you have an actual justification for why you are applying the NQTL. So let's let's say this is an area where it's been you know, proven that there is widespread fraud and abuse, and the plan is trying to put some parameters around um, services in order to curb that fraud or abuse or detect that fraud or abuse. If, if it can be proven, if you can show that, it, that it's based on objective unbiased data, and if you can show that the um, approach you've taken to try to curb that fraud and abuse is, is narrowly tailored 
um, such that it has you know, the, the least negative impact on mental health and substance use disorders, you might be able to justify it under that exception. Similarly, if you are applying an NQTL and you're relying on impartial professional standards, so generally recognized independent professional medical or clinical standards, and you're not deviating from those standards, that might be a justification. Where you get into trouble is when you rely on those standards, but then you say, oh, but I also want to do X because I think it, you know that would help to curb some of these expenses as well. And there's no justification for adding that additional step or limitation. Um, okay, so let's take a look um, at an example related to the exceptions. So in this case, a plan develops a medical management requirement for all inpatient out-of-network medical surgical and mental health substance use disorder benefits with the goal of ensuring treatment is medically necessary. The medical management requirement impartially applies independent professional medical or clinical standards consistent with generally accepted standards of care, and the plan doesn't deviate from those standards in any way. The plan relies on no other factors or evidentiary standards in designing or applying the NQTL. And the plan has gone through the standard um, design and application of the NQTL, has done that analysis, has determined that um, everything's kosher under that analysis. The, um, let's see, the plan reviews the, um, The, oh, sorry. The, okay, so the plan evaluates the data to demonstrate the impact to the NQTL, and the data evaluation reveals that it results in a higher percentage of denials for mental health and substance use disorder claims than it does for medical surgical claims. So this is where we get to everything looks great in writing, but then when we start to look at the claims data, we're seeing a disparate impact. Um, because benefits were found to be medically necessary for a lower percentage of mental health and substance use disorder claims based on the impartial application of independent professional medical or clinical standards. Because the plan is applying those um, impartial medical clinical standards here and is basing its medical necessity determination on those standards, not on any other criteria, not on any other factors, there is no violation. It just so happens that when you apply those impartial standards, it's going to have a disparate impact on mental health and substance use disorder benefits. And I think that's where we can start to see the benefit of these exceptions playing out. That, you know, there, there may in reality be situations where there are legitimate reasons for treating mental health and substance use disorder benefits and services differently from medical surgical services. All right, um, so just a couple additional key clarifications. Um, plans are prohibited from applying an NQTL if it applies only to mental health and substance use disorder benefits and not to medical surgical benefits. Um, and if plans are providing any benefits for mental health and substance use disorder condition in any classification, it has to provide meaningful benefits in all classifications. Um, just as an example of how those play out. So we, and I would say this is not necessarily a, a new um, requirement under these regulations, but it expands or sort of codifies um, the DOL's view on, on current processes and procedures and what they've currently seen in some of these NQTL analyses. So autism benefits covered in network, but only out of network for diagnostic services. Um, the medical surgical benefits generally are available for out of network care. So here we have autism benefits being limited in an out of network context where we don't see the same limitations applying to medical surgical benefits. And it's a violation because there's no meaningful autism benefit for the out of network classification. Um, similarly, nutritional counseling is an excluded service, but the plan generally covers eating disorder services. Again, this is a violation because counseling is a primary treatment method for eating disorders. And the plan generally covers primary treatment methods for medical surgical conditions. So this is a good 
one to highlight because this shows how plan sponsors may not always be in the best, best position to identify when there is um, a, a non-quantitative treatment limitation that is problematic. If you didn't know that nutritional counseling was considered a primary treatment method, you might not have flagged this. And that's why we really need to rely on service providers. Um, all right, the, the changes with respect to the um, documentation of the non-quantitative treatment limitations, um, really they're just expanding upon what they've already told us about what they're expecting for those uh, written analyses. Um, again, as we've talked about, they want you to show your work. They want you to do that impact analysis. They are adding, if the proposed regulations are adopted, a requirement that a named fiduciary actually review and certify that the content um, that, that was addressed in the written analyses meets the content requirement. And then um, Kim talked earlier about the fact that we have you know, a tight turnaround time usually with respect to responding to the information requests. That is not changing. If anything, I think we might see the DOL start to you know, become even more strict about the turnaround time that they are requiring. Um, they are proposing to build into the regs that 10-day turnaround time that we've started to see in practice. Okay, so key takeaways. So, so the big question, right, is what do we do about the fact that we don't have compliant NQTL analyses right now? We know as plan fiduciaries have an obligation to ensure that the plans are compliant with MAPIA. And we know, according to the Department of Labor, that nothing that's been produced so far has been compliant. So what do we do? You know, I think the first step is ask your service provider, are they planning to do anything in response to this guidance? If so, what? If the service provider is going to be beefing up their NQTL analyses and they will apply to your plan, right, that is the best of all possible worlds. If they don't, then the plan has a fiduciary obligation to consider other options. You may look at hiring an independent vendor to conduct the analysis, but I will say right now, the field of vendors who do this type of work is very small. The lines are pretty long. Um, and maybe you need to find a different TPA or service provider. At this point, I think a lot of the TPAs are in sort of the same boat. They're, they're complying to the extent that they know how or can. Some may be a little more obstinate than others. If you have one of those obstinate ones, then maybe you have an obligation to find one that's not obstinate. But the mere fact that you know their NQTL analyses are not good enough right now is not necessarily a fiduciary obligation to switch service providers. But we encourage you to ask your service providers, you know, will you do something better? Will you help us out? Um, and if not, then we have to think about what else to do. And the guidance that we've gotten thus far clearly indicates that many plan exclusions are non-quantitative treatment limitations. And I think historically, plan exclusions have not been something that the service providers have necessarily focused on when doing the NQTL, NQTL analyses. So you want to make sure that when you're getting these analyses that they do address your plan exclusions. If they don't, you need to be asking about that. Um, Service providers might be applying NQTLs that aren't obvious from the plan documentation. So, um, you know, maybe they're not, maybe it's a limitation that they're applying on the back end as part of their standard processes and procedures, and it's not even described in your benefit booklet. Um, as we noted, network composition, that's a huge NQTL that the DOL is focusing on. You're not going to have details about how the network providers are selected, credentialed, et cetera, in your benefit booklets. That's going to be something that service providers are doing on the back end. So you, you'll need to work with service providers to identify all applicable NQTLs, including NQTLs that you have no line of sight into. And if the service provider refuses to provide such a list, you're going to have to ask more targeted questions about the um, analyses that they actually are willing to provide. And then um, the compliance has to focus both on plan design and in operation, as we've said many times. Um, you know, one thing that you can start to do is to do a red flag review of your plan design, um, but that's not gonna be enough. You really have to dig into those claims and see if you're getting a disparate impact. 
Um, and so you might consider doing a claims audit if you haven't done one in a while. All right, we have gotten a number of questions in, we'll not have time to address them all, uh, but did want to sort of start with a couple of, of short ones. Um, first is, if a plaintiff's attorney requests our NQTL analyses, do we have to turn them over? And the answer is, of course, it depends. Um, we know that these NQTL analyses have to be turned over if there's an ERISA 104B4 request for plan documentation. So if that attorney has been authorized and released in writing to get the NQTL analyses, uh, then you have to turn them over. Also, if this is a, in part of a claim or appeal and this NQTL analysis is relevant to the claim or appeal, and if that attorney is the repre authorized representative, then yes, you, you do need to turn those over. Um, we we got a question that was interesting about network composition. Um, somebody had asked about, you know, if the, basically it appears that the DOL is focused on network composition with respect to medical services um, and not necessarily pharmacy services. And, and I would agree that's probably the case. Pharmacy is a little bit different than medical. Um, we're not seeing the kind of network adequacy issues, at, at least as relates to, you know, medical surgical versus mental health parity um, on the pharmacy side is what we're seeing on the provider side. So I think the DOL is primarily focused on um, the, the medical side of the provider networks, not pharmacy networks. Then we had a question about what are the penalties for failure to comply with the NQTL analysis requirement? Um, well, from what we've seen from the Department of Labor, they, they won't let you enforce the NQTL. So if the analysis isn't done, isn't sufficient, then that NQTL just can't be applied. And then technically, we also have this self-reportable excise tax under the Internal Revenue Code for violations of the Mental Health Parity Act. It's $100 per affected individual per day. Nobody really knows how to apply that or calculate it. So that's a different topic for a different day. Okay, and, then, and Let's just take one more since we're over time. Sure. Um, so, so we did get a question about um, telemedicine, and um, I will will respond in greater detail in an email. But um, you know, telemedicine benefits. A lot of times, what we're seeing, especially during COVID, is that plans have added telemedicine benefits. Um, again, usually these benefits are providing uh, care that is greater than what would be considered an accepted benefit EAP. Um, and so they're typically integrated with the medical plan. Well, if you're providing telemedicine benefits and those benefits are, you know, less expensive than um, maybe a, you know, regular doctor's visit under the plan and the telemedicine visits exclude um, behavioral health services, that's potentially a problem, um, not only under quantitative treatment limitations, but also under the non-quantitative treatment limitations. So definitely something that would be um, probably flagged as part of a red flag review and that should be reviewed to determine, you know, how you decided that you would apply those limitations and, and whether the um, cost share that you're applying would be permissible under the quantitative treatment limitation analysis. I just want to make one last note. You know, it, it, we've developed some tools and some sample language and things for our clients. If if you're listening to this and you're one of our clients, please reach out to us or your Thompson Hine employee benefits attorney. We'd be happy to talk with you in more detail about any of this and to share those tools with you. Yep. Thank you very much.